weight loss. Even the words don't really roll off your tongue. <laughs> like, but we all have been there, wanting it, wishing it, wondering why we can't have it. My guest today really has the answers. My guest is somebody whose name I believe that you will recognize, Dr. Susan Pierce Thompson. I'm happy to have her here talking about not just why weight loss is so hard, but specifically what your brain has to do with it and what you can do about it. Spoiler alert, we talk about a couple of things. So if you need the Reader's Digest condensed version or the Cliff Notes right now, planning ahead is a must and you want to and must automate your eating the way you automate tooth brushing. But you're going to want to get the details in this one. I'm Deborah Atkinson. You're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top struggles and concerns. I share what to eat, how to move, and how to change your mindset, often about what to eat and how to move so that you can have the energy and the vitality that you want, need, and deserve in this second and better half. And right now, We are sponsored by the five-day flip. If you have not yet started your exercise program, or if you need a restart, or if you, like me, are an overdoer and you can feel that you're just flat, you're just tired, it's not actually working. The five-day flip is meant to be a reset for you. I'm going to put it in the link to the show notes, so you're going to want to dive right in and listen. Let's get started. My guest today, Susan Pierce Thompson, is an adjunct associate professor of brain and cognitive sciences at the University of Rochester and an expert in the psychology of eating. She is president of the Institute for Sustainable Weight Loss and the founder and CEO of Brightline Eating Solutions, a company dedicated to helping people achieve the health and vibrancy that accompany permanent weight loss. Her program utilizes cutting edge research to explain how the brain blocks weight loss and every day she teaches people how to undo that damage so they can live happy, thin, and free. Susan, thank you so much for being here. Deborah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here with you. Of course, this is a hot topic. You are either about to be the best or worst friend of my entire audience. <laughs> so, so watch fair, yourself. Fair. Right. <laughs> but one question I like to ask before we dive into really, I won't waste a lot of time because I know my audience is curious about so much of what you have to share, but why this? Why is this what you're doing? Is there a personal story behind it? Oh, yeah, totally. Um, It's all personal story behind it. I mean, I struggled with my food and my weight uh, most of my life, really. Uh, But, you know, it's interesting. I was um, not a really heavy kid, but I weighed more when I was 11 than I do right now. And then um, in high school, I I was really struggling with my weight. And I ended up... um, really doing the only diet that ever worked for me, which was drugs. And I got really hooked on them. Um, the kinds of drugs that that make you not want to eat. So so speed, crystal meth, cocaine, crack cocaine, and um, dropped out of high school, uh, turned to prostitution um, to support my crack habit. And um, that was my life until just after my 20th birthday, I got struck clean and sober. Um, and still clean and sober to this day. So 27 years without a drink or a drug, uh, very gratefully. And um, my addiction, which had gotten so bad to drugs, just hopscotched right over to food. And I blew up um, in a very short period of time. And then that started years and years and years of trying to get recovery with my food the way I had gotten recovery with drugs and alcohol. And it turns out to be um, a similar analogous, but also harder problem. Uh, Food is harder to kick than even crack cocaine in my experience. Um, And of course, you can't kick food completely, you need to eat. So that's part of what makes it hard. Um, But yeah, so after years and years and years of 12 step food programs of various ilks, and then um, 
also studying this academically, um, masters and PhD in brain and cognitive sciences, and many years teaching a college course on the psychology of eating. Um, and finally losing my excess weight when I was 28. So I was obese by the age of 26 and um, took off my excess weight when I was 28. And I've been in my sort of genetically right-sized body for 17 years now. Um, and um, yeah, and I just teach people, I teach people how to crack the code, uh, not just take off weight, but keep it off. And so, yeah, it's all personal, <laughs> all personal. Wow. Okay. You know, sometimes I ask people to come on and tell their story and I was like, I'm glad I was sitting down. That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hold on to your hat. I have lived many lives. Many wow. Lives. Yes, you have. Okay. So I want to pick up on something you said there. Food addiction is more powerful than drug and alcohol addiction. Of course, I understand that we have to eat every day. So therein lies part of the problem. But say a little bit more about that, if you would. Yeah, it's harder on many fronts. You know, the the addiction in the brain isn't more intense. I think it's about comparable. Um, but in terms of the cues to eat, they're far more ubiquitous. Um, food is pushed socially well beyond anything else. And then some, I mean, you know, just getting to work, you pass, um, all kinds of cues to, um, you know, eat in ways that are going to lead you down destructive paths. Right. Um, whereas there are not cues to smoke crack or to shoot heroin, um, as you drive to work. Um, and food, the food industry is um, getting ever savvier at advertising and pushing its wares on us. As a matter of fact, they've started putting um, putting people in fMRI machines to track how their snack food concoctions and their commercials hit the addiction centers in the brain just so and picking the formulations and the and the advertisements that work the best to keep us addicted. So there's that. And this is a multi-trillion dollar industry um, working against us. Um, and then there's this other insidious thing about, um, you know, you can't just quit altogether, um, which makes it really a problem of figuring out where the boundaries are. And that's sort of the the hook of bright line eating is um, you got to figure out what the bright lines are. What are the boundaries that you're just not crossing? Because with cigarettes, it's clear. You're just not going to smoke that first puff. You know, with alcohol, it's clear. You're going to avoid that first drink. But with food, it's an infinitely harder problem. Um, infinitely harder. I so understand it. Okay. And so many, so many women do here too. And there's always that emotional tie. I mean, mm -hmm. And that's totally separate than what you've just said. It's like every one of us alive and breathing, listening to a radio podcast, watching TV is subject to the advertisements and, and all of the cues and signals. But then there's menopause, there's that, and there's the emotions about mm -hmm. everything, really. Mm -hmm. But then there's the emotions specific to the pandemic, what has been a normal life. So I'm really curious, you know, I know the effects of exercise during the pandemic and what's happened. How has the pandemic demonstrated that carrying excess weight is, you know, not only a faster path to dying, but how have people's eating patterns been affected by the pandemic? Well, this is one of those um, places where if you look closely, the addiction is so obvious, right? Because never before have we had the cost of carrying excess weight more in our face, not distant in the future, but like imminently you could, you know, leave your house, get this virus and be dead within, you know, a, a couple weeks, right? Um, with uh, obesity being the leading comorbidity for bad outcomes from COVID. And yet what's happened during the pandemic is 48% of people in the United States have put on more weight. Um, I believe, although we won't have the final figures um, for another year or two, that during the pandemic, we crossed over to 50% obesity in the United States. We weren't supposed to hit that until 
uh, 2030. I think we hit it nine years early, thanks to the pandemic. Um, but absolutely, I mean, uh, eating the way we do, um, the standard American diet, the global industrial diet, um, causes uh, baseline inflammation, uh, which causes an inflammation cytokine storm, which feeds right into COVID um, and hospitalization and death from COVID. So um, the the need to change how we eat has never been more urgent. And yet we seem to kind of sit on the couch and, um, you know, crack open a bag of potato chips to watch it on the news. So it, it's, you know, it's, it's the same as the type two diabetes, right? Um, in the United States, 180,000 people a year have a leg amputated because of type two diabetes. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. And um, shocking enough as a statistic, but what I find more shocking is that uh, within two years, 50% of them will have the other leg amputated as if having one leg, leg amputated isn't enough to sort of convince someone to change how they're eating. So, you know, when people look at my program, Bright Line Eating, and say, not eating sugar at all, isn't that extreme? And I think, you know, what's extreme is what's mm-hmm. happening out there, right? Um, yeah, not at all. That's what's extreme. Yeah. Okay. So, and I want to bring this in too. There is this fat acceptance movement right? Not to discriminate. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that, your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I have to be honest, when you read the tagline in the opening um, blurb, happy, thin and free, you know, I cringed a little bit because we don't use that phrase anymore. um, Because we, you know, thin isn't really the goal, even w- with bright line eating, definitely, you know, shedding excess weight that doesn't feel in alignment with with where someone is with their body is part of the goal for sure. Um, but in terms of the fat acceptance movement, um, it's so nuanced, Deborah. it really is. And I, I just mainly I just want to allow a lot of spaciousness and a lot of nuance in this conversation, you know, having having um, suffered with obesity myself, um, and struggled with my weight, uh, myself, my whole life. Um, I am so eager for people to move past the number on the scale and to, um, you know, and to be able to move free in a world where they don't face discrimination, no matter, no matter their body size, you know, or assumptions of, stupidity or laziness because of their body size, right? No one should be facing discrimination or prejudice around that. Um, and I think it's it's imminently clear that carrying excess weight has health risk baked into it, you know, through and through. Um, even the the relatively rare but present folks today who have obesity, but don't have any markers of ill health. Uh, Research shows that um, within 10 years, almost certainly they will. It's a temporary reprieve. There's some genetic markers that uh, do protect people from ill health, markers of ill health, you know, with obesity initially, um, but uh, not over time. And, um, you know, so what what I try to help people with is the um, is the hollowing out of the personal integrity of like intending to eat one way and then eating another way. You know the the constant betraying oneself with what we eat, how much we eat, intending to you know clean up our act and treat ourselves better with food, and then falling short. And those are all brain malfunctions that when I explain it to people cause a lot of relief, you know, of like, okay, I don't have to be hurting myself with food anymore. Um, It is a brain that's hijacked uh, by our current food environment. But, you know, the, the fat acceptance movement, I think is, I I think we really do need a like, anti obesity discrimination movement, for sure. Um, Whether it's in all of our collective best interests to accept an obesity rate that keeps marching upward unabated, I don't think so. Well said, for sure. And I kind of want to go in and and pick out something that you talked about. And 
see if you'll elaborate on that. So you may be giving away this the the program, but but if you could share just a couple tips or nuggets. I mean, what happens? What is happening to the brain when you you wake up in the morning and you say, "Okay, today I'm going to be better to myself," and and you're planning what you're going to have, and then the wheels fall off the bus. What happens yeah. between wake up and you know dinner or the binge after dinner? Yeah. So um, a few things happen. Um, one is we've fallen into the willpower gap. So unfortunately, willpower doesn't show up for us when we need it most. It's governed by this little part of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex, which gets exhausted by like 15 minutes of intensive decision making or emotional regulation or resisting temptation or what have you. Um, so if we're running our food world based on choices in the moment, we're doomed to failure because, um, the part of the brain that helps us make good choices in the face of tempting options, isn't going to show up for us reliably. So that's the willpower gap. Um, the solution to it is to automate your eating the same way you've automated. Probably most people have their teeth brushing, right? Where it just happens, whether we're in a good mood, bad mood, we've been traveling, we've been at a party late at night, whatever, we still brush our teeth. And um, that kind of routine um, is, that's governed by a different part of the brain, the basal ganglia, and that can save us from um, this sort of decision fatigue, uh, willpower gap collapse. So there's some of that. Um, And then there's um, also leptin resistance and dopamine downregulation in play. So that causes... um, Uh, insatiable hunger, that weird hunger some of your listeners might be familiar with where no matter how much you eat, you're not satisfied. Like you can eat a whole dinner and then sit down on the couch for the evening and and now feel like you need a pint of ice cream to sit there comfortably or, you know, a bag of chips or whatever it is, right? It's it's popcorn. It's popcorn, it's popcorn with my audience. Yeah. You need yeah. popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, well, you, you know, if you actually ask your stomach in that moment, you're not hungry, right? It's really that the elbow needs to bend and the mouth needs to chew. And it's this brain thing of like, I just need to eat more. I just need to eat more. And that's caused by leptin resistance. Um, so leptin is the hormone that says you're you're done eating, you're full, you're done. <laughs> um, and if your brain can't see your leptin, you're just gonna never get there. Um, And what causes leptin resistance is essentially high baseline insulin levels. Um, And that goes away when you give up sugar and flour and you start doing plate line eating. Um, So you can get back that signal that says that you're full and you're done eating. Um, Okay. When you say give up sugar, stop sugar, (laughs) listeners are maybe thinking, well, I never... I never have treats. I don't have cookies or cake. I never have dessert. So I'm good. You would say? I would say um, uh, double check. How about mm-hmm. artificial sweeteners? How about honey, stevia, agave? Um, and then how about flour? So um, any sort of, you know, pasta bagels, cookies, uh, baked goods, um, any of that stuff. When you When you give up sugar and you haven't really gotten the addiction out of your system, your brain will start to rely more on flour to get the same effect. Um, Whole fresh fruit is fine, but not dried fruit. You know, are you still eating bars with dates in them? Um, That kind of thing. In my mind, because of the history you've shared with us, I'm seeing women snorting flour, but okay, that's just me. (laughs) It looks just like cocaine. It's so eerie. I know. If you put white flour and cocaine on a mirror, I swear you might snort the wrong one. <laughs> well, I used to fly with protein powder if I was traveling. So I had it in uh-huh. my hotel to make a shake. Oh, and I know where protein. this is going. This is funny. And I always was like, hot. I wonder if they're going to stop me. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Security is going to get me. <laughs> totally. That's so mm-hmm. funny. Okay. So I have to ask this because we've talked about chips and we've talked about the commercials. I mean, who's subject to commercials more than kids? And 
potentially oh. because they were at home and everybody was trying to not only homeschool and work from home. I mean, they may have been in front of the television more while the pandemic was going on. How are kids affected and how are their brains being changed by their yeah. exposure to all these messages? They're very badly being changed and it's a travesty. It's really, really sad. And I speak as the mother of three daughters. Like I really know the struggle of trying to feed kids well in this environment, this food environment. One of the things that happens with kids that we see and adults too, but it's especially hard on parents when it happens with kids is um, a lot of exposure to, uh, you know, these foods, let's just say, you know, think of a kid's menu at a restaurant, right? Those foods, right? The mac and cheese and the pizza and the etc. You feed rats those foods um, for three weeks. And then you try to put them back on rat chow, the little pellets, just the normal rat food, and they won't eat it anymore. And scientists call it the salad bar option. When you try to give rats the pellets back, the real rat food, it's the salad bar option and the rats reject it. They will literally starve themselves to death before starting to eat their old regular food again after they've been exposed to cupcakes and, you know, and mac and cheese and so forth. And so what happens to our kids is they get enough exposure to these ultra processed foods and their brains are so changed that now they'll look at a full refrigerator of wholesome food and they'll say, there's nothing to eat in this house. And, and all they want to do is go out to eat because they can't handle whole real food anymore. Um, I think the latest stat is that for kids and adolescents today, um, two thirds of the calories that they're consuming uh, are classified as ultra processed foods, meaning they were they were born in a factory. There's there was never a food ingredient in there. It was all factory Ugh. ingredients from the beginning. Um, that's two thirds of the foods that they're eating now. So. Um, you know, and we're talking, it's scary stuff, Deborah. it's scary stuff. We, these chickens have not all come home to roost yet. We're talking about a generation of kids who are, you know, half, if it, kids of color, half of them are going to have diabetes by midlife. We're talking blindness and leg amputation by midlife, half of them. And I think for white kids in the United States, it's a third, uh, heading toward, that reality. And, you know, if you want to see someone rant like a lunatic, talk to a pediatrician of any pediatrician in the United States about this, because they see it happening under their eyes. And there's nothing they can do. There's not it's, it's, it's frightening. What would you say? So mo mother of three girls who, given your history, I mean, does that do you have fear about their future? Or are you ultra careful with your own girls and the message that you send? Oh, gosh. Um, I try not to focus on the fear because it'll be what it'll be, right? Mm -hmm. And I try to keep my eyes on my own plate. Um, I keep my own food great, which doesn't mean restricted. I eat more than most of the people around me. I eat massive quantities of delicious, you know, abundant, most, you know, mostly produce foods. Um, and hope, hopefully my kids will, I mean, that's, there is strong research that kids end up eating like their parents eat. So fingers crossed on that. Um, but, um, oh gosh. Yeah. Am I worried? Yeah. I mean, the addiction in our family, both me and my husband have addiction in our family, eating disorders and addiction, both sides of the family. So, you know, my kids are 13, 13 and 10 and I'm just breathing. I'm just breathing. You have <laughs> you have twin thirteen year old girls. I do. Oh my gosh! <laughs> God bless me. We're yes. doing okay. We're doing. Right. In, in, I have to say, it's a very hard age for COVID. It's a very. I mean, seven. Uh, my oh. twin thirteen year olds, you know, have got now gone through sixth and seventh grades in COVID, and it's a mm. it's, that is really hard. Oh gosh, I can't imagine. Uh. Oh, gosh, I feel for you. Thank you. <laughs> but I also, I also think they're very lucky to have you because I think there is a strength that comes from having gone through everything you did and coming out on the other side and, and being there, making good out of it for other people. 
that's a great opportunity for them. So. Well, I think I think one of the things that does feel helpful is I'm comfortable sitting in pain mm-hmm. with them. You know, when it's hard, I don't try to swipe that away. You know, um, it's like I can just sit there and be like, "Yeah, this is really hard," um, mm-hmm. which I think they appreciate. I mean, even one of a one of them, their therapist is still trying to like get them to you know, and and they come home to me and just say, you know. I just like being with you because you know what it's like to just, you know, I don't know, sometimes not be able to do right by yourself, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. and let that be okay for the moment. I would love for you to come back to like physical hunger and, okay, so there's the, you know, am I really hungry and then not being, but if you've, if you've got physical hunger and you've been someone who has been out of control and you know being there the feeling of hunger probably is not all that comfortable like just the knowing i can eat and that will go away maybe isn't there and i'm i'm literally asking that's a question but how is that different you know from the need to you'd mentioned chew and have the arm action from emotional or is it not different it's all just interwoven no, I think it's it's very different. Um, so one of the first things I teach uh, my people about hunger is hunger is not an emergency. Um, and I teach them to breathe and get curious about the feeling. And because so many people have such a reactive uh, history when it comes to hunger and fullness. Um, and I just ask them to look at those sensations just somatically, just sit and, you know, just l- watch your stomach, like look at it grumble, like, okay. Is that such a scary thing? I mean, I remind them no one ever starves to death between lunch and dinner. <laughs> um, and, you know, when when they're eating a really ample, healthy, balanced plan, you know, and, you know, it's an hour before mealtime and they're hungry, you know, I, I really invite them to... Um, to like breathe into that and look at that. So, so there's that. Um, but there is absolutely a difference between that and emotional hunger. Um, and there's also a difference between that and the leptin resistance type of hunger, the insatiable hunger, um, the like brain driving you to eat beyond all reason, uh, quote unquote hunger. Um, emotional hunger is, it's an interesting beast, right? I- emotions are a cue to eat, but honestly, Deborah, just like lots of things are a cue to eat, right? Driving past a certain Starbucks or, um, you know, waking up and now you have a conditioned expectation for cream and sugar and a cup of coffee or, right? So places, times of day, certain people, certain circumstances and certain emotions are all cues to eat. And for some of us, Uh, emotions are some of the most intense cues for sure. And I think a lot of that goes to, you know, um, food being our number one coping strategy, right? Which is something that when people decide to change how they're going to eat is is one of the first things that they're going to need to look at. So good. Thank you for putting that so succinctly together, tying them all in. And before we go, so I think probably... You know, we're talking to women 45 to 70, and if you're younger or older, stick around. We're not ignoring you, but that is is the majority of our listeners. Is there something that you would like to say specifically to them, to that demographic, and of course, a lot of them into perimenopause, menopause, and just on the other side of it, post, is something specific that you would say to them, what would that be? Yeah, totally. I just published a study. And when I analyzed these data, it blew my mind. Um, So I looked at thousands and thousands and thousands of people who'd gone through the Brightline Eating program. Um, For two months, I looked at the first two months of their data. And I looked at initial weight loss in the Brightline Eating program across age cohorts. So we're talking about Uh, women in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond. And what we found was no difference by age. People lost clinically significant weight, um, you know, 
roughly 13 to 17 pounds in those two months, regardless of their age. And as a matter of fact, the age group that had the, on an absolute basis, had the highest rate of weight loss was women in their 50s. Um, but there was no statistical difference between, you know, women in their 50s, women in their 20s, women in their 70s, no statistical difference, like equivalent weight loss, statistically speaking. And, you know, you could say, well, how is that possible? Because uh, post menopause, for sure, it's harder to lose weight, right? And mm-hmm. the answer is, well, the reason that it feels like it's been harder, which it has been probably the way you've been trying to do it. Mm-hmm. is that um, your estrogen is low. That's kind of the hallmark of menopause, right? Is that your estrogen kind of finally, it sputters in perimenopause and then it tanks and stays low, right? That's what that's what menopause is about hormonally. And estrogen um, has a facilitating effect on insulin. Insulin is a fat storage and fat release hormone And um, when your insulin is really sort of sensitive and spry, you can sort of be forgiven by your body for eating, um, you know, highly processed foods. And when you don't have estrogen to support your insulin, uh, that cushion factor goes away. And so whatever it is that you've been eating, um, it just, it counts a lot more. It shows up. And so in Brightline Eating, when we eliminate sugar and flour, and just to say, it's not a keto program, it's a very um, balanced program. We eat, you know, fruit, all fruits, all vegetables, all grains, all, uh, all foods, really all whole real foods. But when we eliminate um, foods that aren't foods, the ultra processed foods, from the diet, um, suddenly it levels the playing field and it turns uh, a woman's body, you know, um, who's, you know, 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 um, into the same sort of fat burning proclivity as um, she would have had when she was 20 or 30. So that's, and we published this study. um, And again, it's not a small cohort, uh, thousands, I think it was like 4,600 and something, something people. And so um, yeah, shocking, shocking data. I've never seen anything like it in the weight loss literature. Wow. That is awesome. Thank you so much. And on that note, we're going to end, but first everybody listening right now wants to know where can they get more Susan? Where's the best place to find you? You know, I think brightlineeating.com, B-R-I-G-H-T-L-I-N-E, eating, brightlineeating.com is probably the best place to find me. And there's a quiz you can take there to find out how addicted your brain is when it comes to food. Um, And yeah, there's just a lot more resources there. So I think that's probably the best place. So good. And listeners, we've got that in the show notes. It again is brightlineeating.com. And we'll also put links to reach Susan via social media. I know she's got some great channels because I'm actually following that. So now it's your turn. Is there a question? I do the best I can to sit in this seat and think, what do they want me to ask? But if I missed a question, you can add your question or your comment below the show notes. And that'll be at flipping50.com forward slash bright line. And what are you waiting for? Let's start flipping 50 today. 